Thank you for joining us at City Church International. We truly hope this message blesses you and imparts life. It is our privilege to offer you these sermons for free. And for many more great resources that are free and are established on the gospel of grace, please visit us at ccrhk.com. We also have many fantastic books available to purchase that carry a huge world message of grace by some amazing authors. If you would like to financially bless the ministry of City Church and help us fulfill our vision, then please visit the donations page on ccrhk.com. We highly value and appreciate your partnership. God bless you and enjoy this message. Regarding Malaysia, thank you so much for praying for us. It was a time of just a pure flow of grace. It was just an amazing, amazing time. I'm going to, I'm so proud of Ronnie. He, he taught a message on having no confidence in the flesh. It was a powerful message. It had amazing impact. It's a, it's a whole, it was 150 leaders and workers who are very keen to move forward in the grace of God. They really honored us. They received us with such hospitality. Malaysian hospitality is amazing. The food's amazing. Ryan and I ate Dorian, so we are, uh, it's my second time I've eaten Dorian. Don't ask me if I like it or not. I'm going to just be polite, all right? Ryan didn't swallow his. I did. <laughs> Don't say that right. <laughs> and uh, if you haven't eaten durian, you haven't got into Asia yet. You have to eat durian to qualify to minister and live in Asia. All right. Anyway, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> now, I'm convinced millions of Asians are lying and pretend it's nice. But anyway, no, I'm joking. All right. But uh, everything was translated into Mandarin, so it, uh, it was an amazing time of uh, uh, mi mixture of Chinese, Indians, uh, local Malay people. Just an amazing, amazing time. I want to ask Ryan to come for a minute and just share a few things, uh, what was highlights to him. Um, yeah. Woo! <laughs> it, was, uh, it was good to go, but it's great to be back. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> I must say it was five five days and I must say I, I really missed my beautiful wife Kylie and our four little angels. Hey but you were with me that whole time. I know right? I mean, and, and I was also going to say <laughs> that for me the best part of the trip was to spend five days uh, with my dad yeah. pretty much 24 hours thank, thank you uh, very much, together. Um, I don't know if we've ever done that in our no, life. No we haven't. <laughs> Probably the first time we've done that and it was actually it was, it was awesome. It was, it was awesome. a good uh, Male bonding time, father son time. Hey, we're like friends, man. We're like yeah, mates. Good friends, good mates, and we got to minister together as well, which was a huge blessing. Um, yeah, uh, the the trip was was great. They um, they really opened their hearts to us. We had uh, three days just with the leaders. It's basically it's one it's one church with lots of satellite churches as well as uh, many ministries. They have 23 houses. Um, that they use those houses to reach out to uh, drug addicts, orphans, um, uh, you know, like victims of crime, uh, mentally handicapped children, um, yeah. just all kinds HIV. of people, HIV um, patients, and just all kinds of different people that are, you know, and they, so they're reaching out, they're loving, they're making an impact. Um, they were. They, they, they were very spirit-filled and very lively, and they seemed very happy. Um, but there was, I've got to choose my words carefully, but there was still a bit of a veil of the law in the place um, over people's minds. And so we went fairly extreme with the grace message. Sure did. Um, the first two or three sessions were fairly hard because you'd, you'd look at their faces and some of them would be crying you could see the lights were going on they were getting this others were looking at you like what on earth are you talking about like seriously it can't be this good <laughs> you know grace cannot be that good you know are you for real and and so there was barriers and stuff but by, by about the third session um just it eventually just seemed to break through yeah. and yeah. they dropped their guards and they opened their hearts to us and uh, i tell you the message just went in the spirit went in dad i must say dad was on fire Dad was in his zone, um, better than I've ever seen him before, just, just firing and, and just spirit-led, just saying the, just the right things you know that they need to hear that just broke barriers down and just, just pierced deep into the heart. And you could feel the grace going in 
by the end, um, they were very excited, very happy that we came. They're inviting us back. You have to come back. The leader of the church, the network, I mean, he was amening and shouting the loudest um, through the whole time. And he, he said, you have to come back and bring my whole church into this message of grace. And uh, so, like, we, we crossed the line with them. Yeah. We, we crossed the line of no return. And uh, I think if they try to <laughs> pull back now, it's going to be chaos. Um, but uh, people really seem to be in it. There was, like, deliverance happening, people getting, uh, like, delivered of, of demons and, and healings and lots of words of knowledge. And uh, it, was, it was a really good time. It was really exciting. I, I loved it. It was just a highlight, one of those just blessed times in your life when you get to minister the gospel and see people receive it and come alive again. There was people coming up to us afterwards just crying and just asking questions um, and, and just had the opportunity to minister to them. So, yeah, it was, it was a really good time. I've probably forgotten to say a whole bunch of stuff, yeah, but that's, great but that's all right. Excellent. It's excellent. And uh, so we're hoping to go back in the second half of this year, spend five days again, and hopefully take some people from this church with us. It's only a three and a half hour flight, and probably you can get tickets for under 3,000 Hong Kong dollars. Um, so, good time. Really wonderful people. Malaysians are wonderful people. They just uh, just got such hospitality. So, I didn't realize that. Such humor. Some of the funniest people I've met. They just joke. They, they're Chinese, but they use sarcasm. Now, in Hong Kong, sarcasm is not understood as humorous. Whereas they just use sarcasm all the time. They're just, I thought, like, no, come on now. And uh, they loved the fact that I could sing the click song. The cars is click. They, they didn't understand the Zulu and the cars and click song. So the highlight of the conference was me singing uh, Miriam Makiba's click song. You know, Anyway, it was a ho- it, it, they just thought it was great. They thought it was great. All right. All right, let's get serious now. Get in the word. Hallelujah. So just great people, great, great leaders, great leaders. Open your Bibles to uh, Galatians 5.4. I want to... Uh, commence with my promise that I made last week that very soon we're going to be preaching for much shorter time. So I'm, I'm hoping to get, do this under half an hour, around about half an hour this morning. So probably half the normal length of a sermon. And uh, I, I know unbelief is thick and heavy in the room and, and you've got every right to have that spirit. I'm, I'm at fault and I'm to blame. All right. You're not. So if you've got any unbelief, God bless you. I understand. The Lord will bless your unbelief because he understands, all right. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, don't start timing until we've got the message going now, right? Don't start from when I got up. This is the message now, all right? <laughs> I, I can't wait for this message. It's just so it's good news that I'm looking forward to it myself. I mean, yesterday I got home, got home Friday night. Yesterday I pre- started really preparing for today, but I didn't preach this in Malaysia. It wasn't, I'm not just serving you up something I've got ready for there. Every place has a tailor-made, every meeting has a specific key to open that meeting, and this key is for today's meeting, all right? So I can't wait to hear it. Um, I just want to say, when we're away, we just, I, just, I thought about people in this church, this church, and I felt the love of God for the people of this church, and just gratitude. Thank you for being who you are, City Church International. Very grateful to have this company of people to be part of this church called City Church. I feel very proud in the right sense of that word to be a member of this church with you guys. So God bless you and God really has something special for you today. There was a husband and a wife. They were both, in the, they were both 60 years of age and he was under the law and she was living in grace. And an angel suddenly appeared to the two of them and said, I've come from the throne room of God to bring a blessing to you. You can wish for anything, one wish each, and I will give it to you today. So the wife said, Oh, I just wish for a luxury pleasure cruise on a ship with my husband. And the angel said, No problem. Bing! Gave, he said, It's yours, ma'am. And he said, What about you, sir? And the husband said to his wife, Sorry, dear, but uh, I wish to be married to a woman 30 years younger than me. So the angel said, No problem. Bing! And the husband was 90 years of age. <laughs> It's 
uh, I would rather live under grace than under law. Okay? That is not in the Bible. It is not theology. I made that up. Okay, but I want you to say it's, it's better to live under grace than under the law. I, I want to talk in the next half an hour. From now, set your watch. No, don't sit. Well, don't look at your watches, okay? Don't be so legalistic. You get 30 years older quickly if you... <laughs> Javon says half an hour is a stupid idea. <laughs> but um, but I, I want to talk today. I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to talk to us today about having Christ having full effect in our lives. Christ having full effect. Now, to understand how Christ can have full effect in your life, you have to first understand what will cause Him to have no effect. See, when Christ is of no effect in a Christian's life, He never heals anybody, He never lifts any burdens, and He never brings any blessing. If He's of a little effect, and I would say the church world right now is having Christ of a little effect. If He's of a little effect, He sometimes heals, He sometimes lifts burdens, and He sometimes blesses. But if Christ is of full effect, then He always heals, He always blesses, and He always removes burdens. So we want to look today at what makes Christ of no effect so we can do the opposite so He can be of full effect. Now I'll tell you a secret. It is, it is, you can call it a burden if you want, but it's the, it's the sweet and exquisite, crushing, deep desire that I have and carry every day in my life, the longings and the desires that are way beyond words to describe to you. It, it nearly drives me insane. Say, so, well, don't go insane, Rob. Yeah, but it nearly does the deep longing to have Christ operating at full effect in the church of Jesus Christ. I feel the scandal of seeing only partial capacity of Christ in operation. It, it's like the world mocks us and ridicules us. And even Christians become cynical because they go, well, why isn't Christ doing more? Because you see, there are certain things that Christ will not violate and He cannot be at full effect while we live under the law. And to the degree we get free from legalistic thinking or performance pressure in our mindsets, the earning and deserving syndrome, to the degree we get free from that, to that degree Christ increases His effect in our lives. All right. So we're going to read Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 1 to 4. And I love this thing of freedom. It, it, verse 1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, Stand firm then. See, a lot of Christians just don't stand firm. The Bible wouldn't warn you to stand firm if something was trying to push you from your free place. And, and, and many, many, I'd say the majority of Christians on the planet understand it because I've been pushed. I, Rob Rippers, have been pushed from my firm place. I, as a grace preacher, have felt myself going back under the law. I know none of you have because you're all perfectly firm all the time. You don't even have to stand firm. It's just easy for you. No, but for me, I have to stand firm because the Bible warns us, stand firm. If you're not consciously standing firm, you are moving from grace into law. If you're not standing firm, 100% guarantee the Bible wouldn't warn you to stand firm if there wasn't a danger of going back under law. It's 100% for sure. You will go back under the law if you're not standing firm. Galatians 5.4 says... Uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Uh, some people say, I'd just like to get free for a start and then start standing firm, you know. But stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obliged to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Now, friends, the issue of circumcision means nothing to us today in the modern world. But then it was a very big deal uh, to be circumcised because that was a sign that you were obligating yourself to live under the law of Moses or under the law of performance to earn and deserve. Today, circumcision means nothing. And Paul goes on in verse 6 and says, circumcision or no circumcision or uncircumcision has no value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. So let's forget about the word circumcision. It's just an obligation to go back under the law. And Paul says when you try to be justified by the law or to be blessed by the law or to get healed by your performance 
or to have burdens lifted by what you do. He said, when you do that, you are alienating yourself from Christ. You have fallen from grace. All right. Now, he's not saying you've lost your salvation. He's not saying you're not going to heaven. He's just saying while you're on this earth, grace isn't operating in your life. Christ is of no value to you. And friends, when you're sick and Christ is of no value, the healing power of Christ, the effectiveness of Christ, cannot operate to heal a body if Christ is no value. To come under the law to any degree will reduce the effectiveness of Christ Jesus in our lives. So um, the New King James Version, if we can just have that up again, it says, uh, uh, it says, uh, where, where, where? okay, New King James says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Um, that, that's King James Version, right? Then it says, uh, uh, you have become estranged from Christ. So we get these words, you've been alienated from Christ, Christ is of no effect unto you, you've been estranged from Christ, okay? So to be alienated from Christ, to, you know, an alien is someone that doesn't belong there. To be alienated from Christ is to be removed from the glorious influence of His anointing, His favor, and His wonderful presence. You know, to, the, the influence of the presence of Jesus is like, a, is like a perfume. It's like an aroma of life. There's, a, there's just an awesome sense of His presence uh, it, operating in your life. But when you're alienated from Christ, you lose that privilege of your heavenly citizenship and you begin to operate just like a mere mortal earthly citizen. But we are not to be alienated from Christ. We are to be integrated with Christ and to operate with Christ at full effect. He says, if you go back under the law of performance, you will be in estranged to Christ. Everyone say, estranged. Do you know, Christ becomes a stranger to Christians who go back under the law. When you listen to people talk, you think, jeepers, you know, do they really know Christ? They once knew Him, now they've become estranged to Him. Now He seems far away. Now He seems like a distant influence on their life. Other things are now becoming bigger influences on their life. Other things are becoming bigger priorities because they become estranged to Christ. You lose that effortless intimacy. See, I don't believe you need to pray three hours a day to hear the voice of God. Uh, we gave the escalator uh, uh, illustration in, in uh, Malaysia. Oh, they loved it. They really loved it. But uh, we'll talk about that. And, uh, and you see, running up that descending escalator, it, it, that's hard work. But going up an ascending escalator, it's not like you don't pray on the ascending escalator. It's just a flow, though. It's just so easy. You live in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit. You can pray hours a day, and you never clock it. Oh, I prayed two hours today. I prayed half an hour today. No, you're just praying in the Spirit. On the MTRs. Every, you're, just, you're on that ascending escalator. You're not a stranger to Christ. You're not alienated to Christ. Christ is having full effect in your life. You're more committed than you ever were under the law. You, you're serving. You're loyal. You're faithful. You, you're just living in freedom. You love the local church. You're giving yourself to the purpose of God to you and you're not under the influences of this world's pattern of thinking you're not you're not a worldly person who thinks with the wisdom of this age you're operating by the wisdom from above can you say amen and the king james says christ has become of no effect to you now that's the that's the bit, that's the phrase i want to use today christ has become of no effect when he's of no effect he lifts no burdens he remove he doesn't bless and he doesn't heal anyone we see Christ of some effect. We see some healing. We see some burden removing. We see some blessing. But imagine when this planet sees a local church where Christ is of full effect in their lives. How many of you want Christ to be of full effect in your life? All right. Praise God. Well, what makes Christ of no effect in your life? Now, if you ask the average Christian that today, they will say, it's sin, Rob. There's too much sin in the camp. It's sin that's cut us off. And that's why Christ is of no effect. Friends, that's true if you were living under the old covenant. Under the law, when you sinned, you were totally cut off from God. Straight away. Any sin under the law, you cut off from God. But under the new covenant, if you try to live under law, you cut off from God. It's the total opposite now. And the, that's the big thing we had to communicate in Malaysia. It's not like just people preach law or preach grace. They mix them together and they dilute each other. Listen, 
when Jesus walked on this planet, every sinner that touched him was healed. Sinners. Thousands of people. Don't tell me all those thousands that were healed were all holy, sinless, perfect people. No, they were being healed. Christ was of full effect in their lives. They were getting healed of the most gross and demonic stuff and effortless miracles radiated from Jesus Christ. He was full effect with sinners. In fact, so much so in Luke 7, the Pharisees accused Jesus and said he's a friend of sinners. See, what makes Christ of no effect is this mentality I've got to earn and deserve. Now, we've been down this road many times in this church. Hang in. It's going to get very clear in a few minutes. All right. Just hang in now. It's, it's uh, any thinking that says, I've got to earn this, I've got to deserve this. That thinking, that performance thinking of earning and deserves makes Christ of little or reducing effect down to no effect. So you can fast for 20 days to get miracles. But if there's legalism in that process, those miracles are not going to happen. It's going to be a huge disappointment. I'm not against fasting. If fasting helps you release faith, then there's a place for fasting. But friends, anything we do, putting in the slot machine, and now we want to get back the miracles from God, that makes Christ of no effect, that alienates you from Christ, and that makes you like a stranger to Christ. See, if, if I want to really please Glenda because she's just so beautiful and, 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 and she's so powerful and she's so influential and awesome and amazing woman and I'm frightened of her and, and I'm trying to avoid her anger and uh, I just want to please her because she's so phenomenal and my whole life is wanting to please her but really I'm trying to avoid her anger and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to uh, get into her good books then my motive for doing that is one of insecurity see people that come under performance basis to please God become self-righteous on the outside, but very insecure on the inside. Legalistic people are very self-righteous on the outside, but if you could see their hearts, they are very, very insecure. They're very locked up by the law. They're very bound in the emotions. They don't know how to laugh properly, except if it's just natural humor and natural laughter, but they don't know how to just have joy for no reason at all except that Christ is their personal, intimate friend. They're not a stranger to Christ. He's a full effect or increasing effect in their life. Can you say amen? You see, if I don't understand that Glenda loves me totally, if I don't understand that she already made a decision that she's going to cancel all my future sins, she's never going to be disappointed with me, she's made a decision that it's impossible for her to be angry with me, it's impossible for her to ever disapprove of me again. That I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this by faith now, okay? No. <laughs> that she will never, ever be upset with me again. If I don't know that, friend, and I'm trying to please her, I am ministering to her out of a spirit of insecurity. And I'm trying to earn and deserve her favor, earn and deserve her love. Many marriages are based on that in Hong Kong. You give me, I'll give you. Earn and deserve, it's based on insecurity and outward self-righteousness, falseness, artificiality, performance pressure that makes us insecure on the inside. Amen? And then if Glenda comes to me one day and begins to say, she begins to correct me. Everyone say correct. But her correct is from the spirit of love, from the spirit of gentleness. And she begins to say to me, Ron, I want you to understand that I want you to change the way you think about me. I'm not a hard taskmaster. I'm not difficult to please. I really love you. I've made the decision never to be upset with you ever again. And, and I want you to understand that this earning and deserving thing, this servile thing, this insecure thing, this, this neediness to please me out of insecurity, I want you to change the way you do that and just become secure because it's already dealt with. Everything in your future sins are cancelled and I'll never stop loving you. It's unconditional. And she begins to correct me like that. But if I'm insecure, I take that as disapproval. I take that as rejection. And it starts making my insecurities even more insecure. So now I'm trying harder to do the right thing. Then if I see Glenda publicly honor someone 
and publicly affirm someone and say, I just love the way that person trusts me and trusts my love and trusts that I'm not a hard taskmaster and they think of me in a good way. Now my insecurity is now shifting not only from insecurity to insecurity, now my insecurity is now becoming jealousy and then my jealousy is becoming bitterness. And so, so imagine this. If that way with your wife, how much more with God? Because God is awesome. He's infinite. He created the heavens and the earth. Okay. And imagine if we think we've got to serve God on a performance basis. We are insecure. We are self-righteous on the outside, insecure on the inside. Are you still with me? But when we get a revelation that actually God has already decided He's going to love us unconditionally. It's His whole nature. He's already dealt with all our sins at the cross. He's cancelled the law at the cross. In Isaiah 54, verse 9 and 10, God took an oath. He said, I swear by myself, I will never, ever be angry with you ever again. I will never withdraw my favor from you, my love from you. I'll never withdraw that. And then He says, I will never withdraw my covenant of peace from you ever again. Now, when we get a revelation of that and it gets down into our heart and begins to change the way we think, when God comes and corrects us and says, I want you to change the way you think about me even more. I'm even more loving than what you think. I'm even more gracious than what you think. We don't feel more insecure. We actually feel great. We don't get bitter. We get better. Amen. And then when God blesses someone and heals someone and publicly commend, commends them and approves of them, we don't get jealous or bitter. We get better. Can you say amen? See, when the prodigal son came home to the father... Uh, uh, just remember, boys, that, that this guy was, was not just in the little league of sinning. I mean, some, of, some Christians think they, they're really bad sinners, but they're not in the big league. Uh, this guy was in the big league. He had spent all his father's money, inheritance. It said he had spent it on many prostitutes. He didn't have a short shot at prostitutes. This is Jesus giving the parable, not me. Don't preach, Rob, you're preaching license for sin. Tell Jesus that he gave the parable, Luke 15. And it's not license for sin, by the way. He spent all his money with prostitutes, and then he gets in a pigsty. Now he's on his way back to his father's house. He's rehearsing his repentance speech. The father runs, kisses him, throws his arms around him. Father will not allow him to repent. Look for it. He tries. You can see him rehearsing his speech. Gets to the father. There's no mention of his repentance speech because it didn't get a chance to. Why? Because under the old covenant law, when you were in a holy place or a sacred place or a reverential place, you had to take off your shoes. And one of the first things the father says to the servants, put shoes on his feet. And if you don't understand Middle Eastern culture, you miss. He's saying no mourning here, no false holiness here, no treading on barefoot, shoes on his feet, put the best robe on him and let's celebrate and we're going to have a fatted calf and put the authority ring on him. Everything in my, in my house is his. Now, the older brother was insecure on the inside and self-righteous on the outside. And the older brother was very angry with the father and with the younger brother. Now, the question is why? Why was the older brother so angry and bitter and jealous? Clear. He had fallen from grace he had alienated himself from Christ. Christ was of no effect to him at all. You say, Rob, was it because he had lots of sin in his life that he was jealous and angry? No. Outwardly, the older brother had no sin in his life. He was self-righteous. He was doing everything right. But he had fallen from grace and he, Christ was of no effect to him at all. Now, what about the younger brother? What about him? He had done everything wrong. And Christ was of effect to him. And Christ lifted his burdens. Christ healed him. Christ blessed him. And Christ honored him. And Christ was of effect. He ends up in his father's house. A big party. Fatted calf. Blessings. Rings. Robes. Shoes. Is that the picture of the modern church? Do you think there may be more older brothers in the modern church? He 
it's amazing to me that <laughs> when I get this right. It's not it's not breaking the law of Moses that makes you alienated from Christ. It's the very idea that trying to keep those laws will gain you grace that stops you receiving grace. You see, people think, if I break the law of Moses, I fall from grace. No, it's the very idea of trying to keep performances that hinders Christ being a full effect in your life. this interesting when Jesus walked this earth that all around him thousands of sinners with all kinds of sin in their life were touching him and they were being healed and grace was flowing to them and grace was having full effect and the burdens were being lifted and they were coming into peace and they were being touched by the love of God and there was blessings flowing all around Christ but if you read the gospels carefully not one Pharisee in any place got grace not one Pharisee got healed. Look in Luke 5. It says the whole house was filled with Pharisees and Sadducees. It says none of them got healed. The guys who broke a hole in the roof, that guy got healed. But not one... It must have been boring for Pharisees to go to... You know, imagine being a Pharisee and going to Jesus' meeting. And you send him, and thousands have been healed all around you and been blessed and their burdens have been lifted. And Pharisees get nothing. You know, they must have walked away from those meetings going, you know, I don't understand this because... Um, you know, I, I don't know what the big fuss is about. I, I, I got nothing out of that meeting. I got a full bladder, but I got nothing else out of that meeting because, I don't know, I, I, I just was so boring. See, Pharisees were basically quite moral people, and they were good people, really, in a sense. They were like, they knew the Scriptures well, and they, they tried to do everything right, but Christ was of no effect in their lives whatsoever. He never healed any of them. He never blessed them and He never lifted a burden off them. He wanted to. He couldn't. See, Christ is stronger and more powerful than sin. But He will not operate with His pride. See, He resists pride but gives grace to the humble. And it's amazing if you, if you minister and all of you in this room somewhere has prayed for people and ministered to people somewhere in your life regularly, often, now and again, whatever. And you'll soon discover when you're ministering, there are certain contexts where there's such a radiation of glory and such a, you just minister the Spirit so effortlessly. It's like you just click your fingers and miracles happen. You look at people and a miracle happens. And people just keep receiving. Christ is operating in amazing ways in certain contexts. And the reason for that is, Rob, is it because they've got no sin in their life? No, the reason for that is, in many ways, their minds are no longer locked up by performance, earning, and deserve thinking. They're not under the pressure to earn and deserve. You, you, but in other contexts, you try and minister. People come forward or they're standing in a certain posture and it's so serious and they're trying so hard and you can feel they're so sober and they're so... Uh, intense and it's because they, they feel so unworthy so righteous on the outside but very insecure on the inside so imagine I'm nearly finished imagine 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 if imagine if you were somewhere and the preacher said alright we're going to open up the front of the building today and uh, Christ is going to come and he's going to bless people and he's going to heal people and he's going to just uh, uh, lift burdens of people. That he just, so we're going to open up the front. Everyone comes out. It's going to be great ministry out today. Christ is going to operate you. But only one condition. Only one condition. You're not allowed to come up. We don't want anyone to come up if you feel like you're holy through your own effort. And uh, if you feel like you've got such victory over sin through the strength of your willpower... And the keeping of your law, we don't want you to come up either, please. Don't come up here, okay? And, and if you've got such an opinion of your own self-righteousness, uh, we don't want you coming up either, all right? 
But the rest of you, you struggle with sin, you've got issues going on in your life, and you, you're battling with things, you welcome. All of you, funying, funying, come on up here. We're going to see, uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Now, but let's be honest now, and unfortunately I've seen this on television, and I've been a, a guest in meetings, a visitor in meetings, when this has happened. The apostle or the evangelist or the pastor, whoever, gets up and says, all right, we're going to open up the front now, and uh, everyone who wants to get blessed by Christ and healed and lifted of burdens, you're going to come out the front here. But before you come out, you, to, you, you just search your heart. See if there's any sin in your heart. If there's any sin in your heart, you repent of that filthiness. You deal with that, you deal with this. Any bitterness in your heart, any unforgiveness. You make sure you forgive everyone, get rid of that bitterness, get rid of the filthy sin, get rid of that, and then you can come up. Well, friends, by the time that crowd gets up, Christ is of no effect. See, people say, well, you know, confessing my sin and repenting of all my unforgiveness, it helps my faith. Yes, in an old covenant kind of way it does. And you will see a little bit of blessing and a little bit of healing. But as soon as they go back to the chair, they are still in that way of thinking. Christ can have full effect at any given second, all the time, 100%, all the time in your life, if we learn to fully repent of legalistic, law-based, performance-based thinking. You see, it's, it's really not about, well, Rob, I, I think that I'm just going to rush out and I'm going to sin as much as I can so Christ can be of an effect in my life. No, you missed the whole point. You see, it's not to sin or not to sin. This is the question. That is not the issue, friends. You see, some Christians are on e either extreme. Some are going, well, I'm just going to go out and sin so Christ can be of effect. Now, Paul, in Romans 3, not Romans 6, 1, he said, it's saying something different in Romans 6, 1. Don't have time to go there. But in Romans 3, he says, we are slanderously accused of saying, let's do evil that more good can come. Now, Paul says we are slandering. So Paul was not preaching, run out and sin, because then Christ will be of effect. That is not what we say. But neither are we on this other side saying, I don't want to sin, I mustn't sin, I mustn't sin, because if I do sin, Christ is of no effect. No, friends, both extremes are totally irrelevant to the new covenant. It's a, just a matter of dealing with the way we think. Not earning and deserving, but receiving grace, so that Christ is having full effect. If we go under the earning and deserving mentality, we are estranged to Christ, we're alienated from Christ, He has no effect or little effect, and we have fallen away from grace. See, I, I believe that, I believe that, when did I start? No, don't tell me. All right, I believe that when you, when you, uh, when you get touched, when you get healed in your body under grace, when you get burdens lifted and blessings from Christ, when that happens to you, I tell you what, bitterness and unforgiveness and other dysfunctional insecurities, they start disappearing out of your life. Sin patterns start disappearing out of your life effortlessly. Amen? I want to remind you um, of... Uh, get ready. We're going to be closed in a few minutes now. Just get ready. Just, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I want to remind you, just a few years ago, maybe three years ago, we were up in Reading. For me, this is one of the clearest examples of this. We were um, in Reading, the city of Reading, not California, just outside of London. I, I, Steve, you guys were there, right? you and Gina and uh, other people. Anyway, and we were doing evangelism. And I really am at home, standing on a platform with these hundreds of unsaved people. I love that environment as much as I love this environment. And uh, it was outreach, and they were bringing hundreds of sinners, hundreds of lost people, which I just love to see people come to Christ. It's, 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 it's something I've had to wear my pastor's cap for seven years here. But I want to tell you something. This church will <laughs> move more and more into seeing the lost saved. Because when you live in grace, you get your mind off yourself. When you're under the law, you're insecure, jealous, and bitter. And it's all about me, and it's obsession with me. I heard an Australian lady on television yesterday talking about how she's a, a gay Muslim, that she's a Muslim, and she's a lesbian, and she has a partner, and she's going on how the religion just put rules and laws on her, and now she's got a spirituality that allows, and I just wept, because I thought, if she was brought up under grace, not Christian laws, not Muslim laws, under the revelation of Christ, 
she would never have become a, a lesbian. So all of this new age spirituality would be totally irrelevant if people were not brought up under guilt manipulation and made secure through grace. It's the law that drives people into sinful behavior. It is not grace that should be judged as the problem. See, people under law are some of the most selfish people you can ever meet on the planet. The older brother wasn't thinking, hey, my younger brother's come home. My father's excited about this. He was just bitter because he's self-righteous on the outside and insecure on the in inside. Saying all the right things. Hallelujah. Oh, these gay people. Ah, yeah. And, and all the right, but inside, bitter, full of sin, full of insecurities, and full of unforgiveness because of the law. You, you find a Christian who's living under the law, if they get up tired on Sunday morning, they're not coming to church because it's all about me. I just do whatever I feel like. I just, it's all about, if, you know, I, there's no laying down your life, there's no generosity, there's no commitment because it's, law makes you self-conscious. It's the wisdom of this world. But grace makes you Christ-conscious because you're no longer alienated from it. And you're thinking Christ's thoughts and you're living the Christ life and you're manifesting grace radiating from you. And so we were, we were having these meetings and the one night actually a hundred people came forward to receive Christ. This is in London, friends. This is in so-called cynical UK, which is not cynical UK. People get miracles in the UK as easy as anywhere else if you preach the right message. So it's just so wonderful to see a hundred dinkum sinners made in Hong Kong. Not no, Hong Kong, sorry. Dinkum sinners come forward and just receive Christ. And on that particular night, people, the place was pulling up because miracles were happening. You see. And on that particular night, Glenda came across to me and she said, Rob, we could see two women in wheelchairs in the audience. And she said, I tell you, I just feel like God's saying, that lady's coming out of the wheelchair tonight. So I said, well, let's go to her. Let's go bring her out of that wheelchair. So I walked over with some confidence in Christ. But when I heard her problem, I, I lost all my confidence. She said, uh, no, a young man pushed me into a swimming pool and I broke my neck. And then th damaged my neck. And that, and that was years ago. And then out of that came chronic MS. And last week, I've been in a wheelchair for many years. Last week, my doctors told me, uh, you, 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 you will die. This is going to kill you. She said, I haven't walked for years. I have no feelings in my legs. They're paralyzed. I, I can't move them. They, they're like ropes. They, they're finished. I thought, oh, great, Glenda. Thank you for bringing me here. I said, anyone else needs healing out today? So, so we started praying. And we, just, we don't pray for the sick, we heal the sick. So we started commanding health into her body and releasing the anointing. And we spent longer than we'd normally do with people. But we stayed 15 minutes with her. We, Steve was leading a team of, what, about 100? Uh, you were watching, okay. But you had a whole heal... Uh, you were in the healing team. Yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, you were watching us. Okay. Yeah, like, obviously, yeah, you knew, you knew. <laughs> See, I've got an eyewitness, so that's a good thing. Anyway, it's been about 15 minutes, and we felt the anointing going into this woman. We didn't feel she was just sitting there like, okay, you're the guru, and you've got the gifts of... No, friends, gifts of healing don't heal people. They have to take a gift. A gift is something you take. A gift of healing is not going to help anyone. Christ will be of no effect if they don't take the gift. And people don't know how to take the gift if they're under unworthiness, law, thinking Christ is of no effect because of their condemnation. But this woman was taking the gift and could feel the power flowing into it. And after about 15 minutes, she said, I'm getting pins and needles in my legs. Oh, I feel pins for the first time in years. I said, that's good. And we carried on praying. She said, I feel something all over my body. I said, that's the Holy Spirit. I said, I've got, no, I've got no gifts of healing. I can't heal the left eyebrow of a fly. I can't heal anybody. I said, but it's Christ who's having an effect. And she, I, then I saw faith in her eyes, stronger faith. So those metal plates where they put their feet on, I said, I pulled her feet off and I pulled those metal plates up. And I said, lady, come, let's walk. And she got up out of the wheelchair and she, she walked like this at first. And then about halfway, she started walking faster. And then she was walking like this, fully free. Now, her husband, 
There's a hall packed with hundreds of people. Husband's still standing holding the wheelchair he pushed in. And, and we walk around, this massive hall, people screaming, shout, Wah! I mean, you can imagine, you know, what it's like. And, and we've seen quite a number of wheelchair cases come out. It's just a wonderful thought to see Christ operating at full effect. It should happen 100% all the time. So, anyway, her husband's standing there. I mean, he's got eyeballs out here, and he's going, go like and she comes out, and she's standing there. So I, I give her the microphone, and I said, tell us how you feel. She starts crying and repenting. Hear this. We didn't say, well, only pray for you if you repent of all your sins. Now she's repenting, and she's going, I've had such hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart to that young man who pushed me into the pool years ago. So she got healed with bitterness and unforgiveness and drastic sin of unforgiveness in her heart. Because this is the new covenant, not the old covenant. You say, well, how did she receive with all that bitterness? This is so important, friends. She heard first me preach for 40 minutes on the grace of God and we're free from the law and she said that is what helped her to realize she was not disqualified she was qualified through grace to receive her healing and I want to urge you if you want to see more people healed don't just pray for anybody that asks for prayer first teach them grace because friends grace qualifies people you see it was as she heard me preach grace her heart began to get filled with hope and filled with faith because of what I was preaching. Okay. Then because she had faith, she began to pull with her faith and the anointing is always attracted to where faith is. Amen. So, so, so because she had faith through what I preached, her, her pull of her faith touched something in Glenda's subconscious. And she said, I, I believe that woman's going to get healed. What was that? Was that a word of knowledge? Yes, but it was also Glenda subconscious picking up. Faith was pulling from a woman in a wheelchair because she had heard the message of grace. So I want to tell you, don't just lay hands on everyone. First, teach them grace. Whenever Jesus, teached, uh, whenever Jesus pre prayed for the multitudes or ministered healing to the multitudes, he always taught for hours. Luke 6 says, they came to hear him and to be healed. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't tolerate people, well, we'll just sit in the toilet for the first half an hour while the preaching's going. When the preaching's finished, we'll get in the prayer line and let's get healed. He wouldn't tolerate that. He would teach the kingdom. He would teach the kingdom. And he would teach the kingdom. And faith would come by hearing and hearing by the word. And you see, whenever Jesus prayed for the sick, you always see him teaching on Abraham. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, grace and faith, not the law. The law crushes faith. The law makes Christ of no effect. He said, well, Rob, what about when Jesus is walking down the road and someone just jumps out from the street and says, would you pray for me, blind Bartimaeus, etc. I can almost guarantee you, somewhere those people had sat in the crowds of thousands hearing Jesus talk for three days, morning and night, morning and night, for three days. I guarantee you, blind bottom, almost all of them would have heard him teach the kingdom and the covenant with Abraham, not the law. Even that woman that came behind him and stole the healing from him, when she touched the hem of her garment, it said she had heard about Jesus. She'd heard about who he is and what he does. Amen. See, don't just think that you can go... Listen, in those days, Jesus taught and they got revelation of the kingdom. Up to then, 400 years almost no one was healed. Now they're going to roll into a pool of water and, and the angel stirs the water, but otherwise no healings are taking place, while the law has made Christ of no effect. Don't think we're living in a generation. I don't think we're living in an age where you can just pray for people, and please pray for people in the street, in the schools, everywhere. Amen. But don't think, you, if some, you can just walk up to someone, don't think automatically that they feel qualified to receive healing. Most have been taught the very opposite that this sickness is from God, God's punishing you, you're sinful, and you're under the law, and the sickness is punishing you, and you better repent of all your bitterness, then He will heal you. That's old covenant thinking. Teach them grace, so Christ can be on effect. Amen. Don't get them to repent of their sins, 
get them to repent of law. Self-righteous on the outside, insecure on the inside. See, now closing for the last time. When we're in Malaysia now, we saw some instant healing. Instant healing. After we preached great. And on the last day, there was a lady that came up to me and she, she, she was a wife of a pastor and at breakfast at the farewell time. She came up to me with her husband and she said, she said, um, I nearly missed this conference because I've got cancer that's gone through my body and uh, they had to carry me onto the bus. I was so weak and I was shaking. And she said, your teachings set my mind free. Those were her words. Your teachings set me free. She said, because I was told this cancer and these diseases are generation curses. I said, Christ, our priest, Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law at the cross. She said, you cleared that up. Then I was also told that this sickness is God punishing me and he's using this sickness to make me a better person. She said, you cleared that up. And she went through all the lists of things that were killing her and making Christ of no effect in her life. We covered all those things by the Holy Spirit's teaching in, in those meetings. See, what had happened um, in those meetings, I noticed people when they get hyped up and they try and, they try and they try, they get excited in their flesh. And it's just soulish. So, so when we try to pray for them at first, it, there was no receptivity. It was like concrete, nothing. No Christ, no very little effect, very little flow of the anointing into their life. So eventually, I, on the third session, I realized, okay, we're going to change it. So I said, no, you know, everyone just sit down, relax, chill out, ah, take a deep breath. And then I just said, Holy Spirit, just come on people. Then I looked for the people who see faith will pull the anointing. Those that have been hearing the message of grace, suddenly that faith, ooh, I'm not disqualified, the Lord loves me unconditionally. And so I looked for where the anointing was coming on people, and I could see where he was falling. And you in the white shirt, you come out. You in that black shirt, you come out. You over there, you come out. And they thought I was having great words of knowledge. No, I was just looking where the Holy Spirit was moving. Now, did the Holy Spirit want to move on everyone? Yes. But those who understood grace better were pulling because they felt qualified. And then I just get them up and then, then just lay hands on them and boom, it was so easy. Lay there half an hour, one hour under the Spirit. Got up radiant the next day, just shining free, touched by God. Now this lady with the cancer, I saw the Spirit of God moving on her and I called her up. I didn't know she had cancer. I prayed for the power of God came on her. That, the next meeting, I called her out again, prayed for her. The power of God came on her and went right through her body. And she said, oh Rob, I just feel so free. I feel so energy back in my body. I'm not shaking with that weakness anymore. I feel energy in my body. You see, what did happen? I said, well, keep me in touch. Tell me about the progress of the next few weeks. Let me know. And, uh, but you see, what happened was Christ is always fully affected. It's just for some people, the law has made Christ of no effect. You know, I want to ask you this question. At least somewhere in the week, you've got to have a meeting with Christ where you're not a stranger to Him. I mean, it should be every day for all of us, but I'm not putting that as a law on you because I can't say in the busyness of Hong Kong, I'm walking around all the time fully conscious of Christ. Now, I'd be lying if I told you that. It's not true. But quite a large percentage of the time, on an MTR, in a noisy Hong Kong, I do feel, not a stranger to him, I do feel that he's close. I do feel that I'm not an alien to Christ. I do feel I'm included, I'm accepted, that all I have to do is just lift my hands and he'll come upon me with anointing just straight away. It's, it, if you lay your hands on me, you'll find me one of the easiest people to pray for. I get healed so quickly. Glenda, also, anytime I get sick, say, Glenda, lay hands on me. She just touches me. Power God, I get healed almost immediately. Most times immediately. I'm, the e I'm, I'm a dream for people to lay hands on. Because I don't fight the anointing. I've noticed in Malaysia, some people fight the anointing. They're, they're so afraid of falling or shaking. You know, they risk dying of cancer, some people. But, oh my God, don't let me look like I'm falling and shaking. Because, oh, I might lose control. No, you might lose that cancer. You might lose that bitterness. You might lose that insecurity. You might lose that unforgiveness. You might lose that pride. You might very, lose the very thing that's making Christ of no effect. Amen. Close your eyes for a moment. Lift your hands. Father, we want to thank you for that wonderful anointing of heaven, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you that Christ is always of full effect. 
And we bless you, Lord, and we honor your name, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory. Loving Heavenly Father, you are so wonderful, Lord. You are so glorious, Father. We magnify your name. Jesus. I'm just going to keep with Bonnie. I'm sorry that you're not involved. I know you need healing. Bonnie's struggling with flu this morning. But, uh, Jesus, we just honor you. If your hands get tired, you can put them down. We just honor you, Jesus. You're so wonderful. Oh, Ramama Ronda Ranga, it's not a poor love. Now, people, just hold on for a moment, Bonnie. You put your hands down, take your tired. You know, some people in, in, in the grace movement, or, you know, it's all finished at the cross, and Christ did finish it all. But as a result, they say you shouldn't be hungry anymore, you shouldn't be thirsty anymore, you shouldn't. Uh, pray much anymore. You don't need to do anything because it's already done. No, friends, we're on an ascending escalator and we do pray and we do worship and we do hunger. I hunger for more of God. I thirst for more of God. You know. And so I started singing this funny song, you know, in Malaysia it had Ryan and his spirit. So, you know, people literally say you shouldn't hunger, you shouldn't thirst. You know, it's just, it's, you, you just yeah, you know, I'll give you living water that you'll never thirst again. I know Jesus said that in John 4, but there's a whole lot of other scriptures that show us in the new covenant after the cross, there's a place to thirst. See, you, you get to a level where you'll never thirst at that level again, but then you go to a higher level where you'll thirst for more of God. Amen? So it's like, I'm not hungry, but I want to feast on you. I'm not thirsty, but I want to drink from you. I'm so confused, I don't know what to do. I've got hang-ups, but you're hung there for me. It's like schizophrenia. Are we, are we allowed to be hungry? Of course. You, friends, if you're not hungry for more than of Christ, I would suggest you're probably under the law. You've given up any hope of more. You've given up the hope that actually, like an HIV man came up to me, an Indian man in Malaysia, just absolutely, just, just walking down the road, and he just came up to me, and, and I just, uh, he'd been in the meetings, by the way, so, so I just, I just put my arm around the back of his head and pulled his head to my shoulder. He had HIV and I said, let the, blood con- let the blood consciousness of the spirit go right into this man's body. And he just went out under the power in my arms and I held him there for about 10 minutes. Came to me the next day, eyes shining, something's happening inside of me. Every one of you, Christ, you have full effect. Christ is not operating in my life at full effect. Say, are you sure, Rob? Say, I'm absolutely sure. The whole world, as soon as you get one person where Christ is operating at full effect through your life, the whole world will find out. And now we've got people settling for such low level Christianity. What's the point of going to church? Just hearing the same old things again. What's the point? Friends, what's the point? Fullness of Christ operating at full effect. going to open up the front chair for blessings and burden removing manifestations and healing. But there's one condition. You're not allowed to come up here. If you think you're holy through your own effort. If you think you've earned and deserved. And if you've got bitterness and unforgiveness and sin in your life, you're welcome up here. You're just the kind of people Jesus will have to pick on. Um, and if you're holy in your own eyes through your own effort, you can come up here as well. Just repent before you come up. Of pride. And worrying about uh, what... Uh, uh, another thing, another condition for coming up. If you're worried about what other people think when the Lord touches you, please don't come up. But if you're just so hungry, it's not about me, Lord. It's not about me getting healed. It's about others getting healed through me. It's about me being such an open person to the effectiveness of Christ, that His operations of His Spirit flow through me. And I want to be so equipped in these next few weeks and months, Lord, that Christ will become a greater effect in my life. I'll just give you one minute to just see if there's anything in you that is self-righteous. And then we're going to open up the front up for blessings. You see, you get people, and oh, anyone who wants healing, just come up, they come standing like this, trying to earn and deserve. And it's like, oh, please, oh, no. the power's flowing. Please, take. Please, take. 
Uh, some of you think, well, I've got to shake and fall to receive the anointing. No, not everyone shakes and falls. Some get healed just standing there. You don't have to fall to get healed. You... But when the anointing touches you, don't fight the anointing. Don't fight his manifestation. If he chooses not to make you shake, not to make you fall, and just heal you like that, then you receive. You don't need to sh- shake or fall. That's not a badge of merit. But hey, if you feel the anointing moving on your emotions and you want to cry, or this joy coming out, or you start shaking, don't shut it down. Let the Holy Spirit have His way. So just, Lord, I just, just let's just pray it. People want to be healed. People want to be touched by God. They want to have that touch of heaven. That burden removing presence of God. The love of God. Effortless intimacy. Effortless intimacy with Christ. Not a prayer life based on clocking in and clocking out. I better put in my 15 minutes. I better put in my half an hour. No, no. A love affair with Jesus. A relationship with Jesus. We pray because we're in relationship with Jesus. It's relationship with Jesus that produces the miracle.